Hello everyone and welcome to this month's video essay. A few months ago we talked about how the wealthy are gaslighting America and now we're here to talk about how America is gaslighting you. More specifically, the state of the economy, especially as it pertains to the job market. If you're an adult in America or even if you know an adult in America or honestly even if you're a kid who's recently heard adults in America talking, you probably know that it feels really hard to find a job right now. And yet the narrative we've all been hearing in the news and the media about our economy and especially the job market has basically been the opposite. If you can't find a job, that's a you problem. Things are great and they've never been better. This is also, by the way, very much mirrored in how we talk about the quote, pandemic recovery and the booming stock market combined with the silent slash unspoken recession. And we'll get into both of those things later. But as it pertains to getting a job and especially a decent paying job, the way that people feel is completely different from how we are being told to feel. There's ample evidence on the ground that this great economy we're hearing about so much is not being in enjoyed by the people who actually need it. Quote, but active job seekers say that the labor market feels more difficult than ever. A 2023 survey from staffing agency Insight Global found that recently unemployed full-time workers had applied to an average of 30 jobs, only to receive an average of four callbacks or responses. Between the news, radio, and politicians just talking about how the economy is so great because unemployment is low, and just hearing all that, I just want to scream from the rooftops. Then how come no one can find a job? Said Jenna Jackson, a 28-year-old former management consultant from Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, she's been actively looking for a job since her layoff four months ago. And we return to the iconic Gen Z economist Dot Soller to talk about just that disparity. The current job market, like to put it in perspective, in April 2024 looks remarkably similar to the pre-pandemic one in a lot of ways. Um, our unemployment rate right now is 3.9%, whereas it was 3.5 as of March, February of 2020. And some economists are calling what we're in right now the Goldilocks market, right? It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. But what hasn't bounced back based on the data we have is public opinion about the job market. By almost every measure we have, employees are reporting low confidence, low optimism, and a lot of anxieties about their careers and finances. So I think we find ourselves playing out that old trope that surrounds uh, anxiety, you know? Like, oh, I'm anxious. Well, just don't worry. Like, just stop worrying. Um, and the solution to the disillusionment and cynicism that most American workers report having clearly isn't emphasizing that the economy is good, actually. We'll hear a lot more from her in the video. Now, particularly for certain industries, it is never a great time to be looking for a job. Especially as in the past few decades, we've seen countless good paths to employment basically evaporate. We were all told, for example, that college was basically a guarantee to getting a good paying, stable job and to making you more competitive than other people looking for jobs. And yet for many degrees, having one doesn't even necessarily make you competitive for entry level jobs, but we'll get to more on that later. And we should also note that even landing one of these coveted jobs does not mean you're going to be landing a livable wage, as wages are still very much stagnant while everything from higher education to rent to groceries has become way more expensive. And the gaslighting only gets worse when you take into consideration the nobody wants to work anymore narrative. It seems like nobody wants to work these days.
Basically, we are constantly being sold a lie about the state of the economy and the job market, and often being blamed when we have made, by all accounts, the choices that everyone told us we needed to make in order to get those great jobs. Now, we'll talk in this video about some of the practical solutions on an individual level, although holding politicians to a much higher level of accountability is the only way most of this will change on a macro level. But let's start by just sort of establishing where we are. With chapter one, why no one is hiring but everyone is interviewing. There always seem to be plenty of job listings posted, and yet going through the actual application and interview process feels like a chaotic and endless game of whack-a-mole. There are actually fewer job listings than there were a few years ago, but that's likely due to the 21 to 22 hiring boom, and the current number of listings is pretty normal. Quote, Part of the difficulty stems from a tightening labor market, especially in fields like tech that have had hundreds of thousands of layoffs in the last nine months. There's now, on average, one job opening for every two applicants on LinkedIn, a big change from early 2022, when there was one job opening per applicant on average. At the same time, the job interview process seems to be more terrible than ever before. Applying for jobs can feel like a numbers game, with many people applying for dozens or hundreds of jobs in order to secure a handful of interviews, and of those applications, many you will never hear back from. And if you're applying for a job with a much larger corporation, it may take a month or more before you are either rejected or invited for an interview. And once you actually hear back from one of those, the interview process itself can take between three and six weeks. We sat down with recruiter, career coach, and friend of TFD, Jasmine Reed. Uh, I have seen it. <laughs> Definitely getting longer and longer. Um, why is that happening? At this point, I believe people want to make the best hiring decision. So I do think the intention is, is good and we want to lower attrition. At the end of the day, the cost that it takes to hire someone on, train them, keep them, retain them, it's very large. Um, and while we're pinching pennies, we have to be mindful throughout the entire process. I still would love to see it. Uh, I, I think that's where employers and companies need to actually look at the questions that they're asking, because what I do think is also happening is you're having five rounds and you're having very similar interviews. Um, you're kind of taking from the same question bank. So in the end, is that really a great use of anyone's time? And I think that actually hinders the candidate experience. So I would love to see that change, uh, but it really just comes from a place of we can't afford, quite literally, a lot of companies can't afford to make a bad decision or a bad hire. And with that also said, a lot of people's jobs are on the lines of the hires that you make are a reflection of you. So it's one thing to inherit a team and have to work with them, but if it's your hire and then they underperform, it honestly can become a scarlet letter on you. Whether or not that should be the case is another conversation. So a lot of uh, self-preservation is, is playing a factor into that. On top of that, the interview process itself often isn't just an interview. It can often include some kind of assessment, like an edit test or a coding test, to make sure you can actually back up the skills on your resume. And this isn't even talking about the companies that have recently been exposed for, for example, requiring applicants to come in for a sort of test day of work for which they are not compensated. And the interview process itself is looking less and less humane. In one recent survey of 1,200 US-based employees conducted by the hiring software company Greenhouse, though two-thirds of respondents overall reported having been ghosted after a job interview, candidates from historically underrepresented groups faced a 25% higher chance of being ghosted when compared to white candidates. And of course, there's the time that it takes to check references and run background checks for candidates, all of which is taking a lot longer than it used to. Quote, companies who laid off human resources staff are now delegating interviewing and hiring to line managers who aren't familiar with the process. None of this, Capelli says, means employers are getting better candidates, but it has lengthened the time it takes to hire. The amount of time it takes to hire a new employee reached an all-time high of 44 days in early 2023, according to a report released by the Josh Burson Company and AMS, a workforce solutions firm. And that's all assuming you even get to talk to a real person at a real company for a real job. Because because the phenomenon of ghost jobs are becoming more and more common. Basically, plenty of people are currently applying for jobs that aren't even really available. Quote, even legitimate companies are posting ghost jobs that they don't actually ever fill, according to a survey by Clarify Capital. Employers post ghost jobs to get a pool of candidates that they may use someday to give the impression that their company is growing and to keep current employees motivated, according to the survey of 1,045 managers involved in the hiring process. In short, it's a sh 
show out there, and when you're applying for jobs, you don't even know often what you're applying to. Now, things have fluctuated a lot in the last few years, and economically, fluctuations are sort of always part of the process. But I'm sure most of you are aware, and if you're not, what's your secret? That in the past few years, there has been a unique situation that has made the already complicated job market even more difficult to navigate. And that is chapter two, the pandemic of it all. Economically speaking, in many ways, the pandemic was the best of times and, you guessed it, the worst of times for the average middle-class American. Now, I am saying economically because we have to, for this conversation, remove, at least for now, the entire medical health life impact of the pandemic. Because although that was unequivocally horrible and ill-managed and resulted in many, many more deaths than were necessary, there were some unique benefits coming out of it economically that America historically never engages in, at least not at this scale, that really demonstrated how different things could be if we wanted them to be that way. Basically, during the pandemic, there were unprecedented levels of social programs across many aspects of daily life, from unemployment benefits to family subsidies to small business support, all of which were benefiting the middle class in a way, frankly, our government rarely does. In fact, as we recently pointed out in our video on people not having children anymore, child poverty was temporarily cut in half in this country because of the government support being offered to families. It quickly returned back to pre-pandemic levels and then increased once those benefits ended. The expanded child tax credit immensely helped families during COVID, but after its lapse, the rate of children in the U.S. living in poverty went from 5.2% in 2021 to 12.4% in 2022, more than doubling. And even more relevantly to this video, there was the temporary unemployment insurance benefits. The program initially offered $600 additional dollars a week to enrollees on top of their unemployment, and subsequently $300 per week as the program went on. It was basically a micro-study of what would happen if UBI were implemented, and surprise, surprise, people loved it. So the legislation that's responsible for that is called the CARES Act. Uh, it was passed in March 2020, and it's the legislation that's responsible for all of the COVID spending that we saw during the pandemic. And it is the single most expansive and aggressive response to an economic crisis that the United States has ever seen, bar none. States issued approximately $794 billion, with a B, dollars of combined state and federal aid uh, and unemployment benefits in specific from March of 2020 through July of 2021 on paper, but most states actually stopped those benefits in June just before the cutoff. And one of the things that makes the CARES Act so unique is that the relief was available not only to traditional W-2 employees, as is typical of unemployment benefits, but it was actually available to gig workers and self-employed people. And these are people who don't tend to benefit from the traditional forms of unemployment benefits that are offered in the United States. So the CARES Act was unique for the middle class and working class insofar as it first expanded the coverage of these uh, uh, traditional like unemployment benefits, right? It changed who can benefit from them um, and broadened the, the scope to gig workers and self-employed folks. But it also cleared a hurdle that many social scientists talk about, right? Decades of work in political science is focused on the major, the major barrier for people getting access to benefits for which they're qualified is that they don't know the benefits exist or they don't know how to get them. And on the business front, the support being offered allowed many small businesses like ours to stay in business at a time we otherwise wouldn't have. The financial diet, for example, took advantage of both PPP loans as well as the employee retention credit because we did not lay anyone off during the pandemic. For us, going into the pandemic, events were a huge part of our business. In fact, we were literally on a multi-city tour when the pandemic hit. So it represented a huge hit to our normal revenue. And without those benefits, we would have either had to close our doors or lay off a huge part of our staff. Though it's worth noting that for as much as the PPP loans were a huge savior for some, like us, they were also a massive source of fraud and abuse, including by people who rail against the use of government programs. A montage of people committing PPP fraud and hypocrites who talk about how you shouldn't use government benefits unless it benefits them. 
But for businesses and individuals alike, the party is over in terms of these greatly increased social programs, and we're all essentially being treated as if things have gone back to normal, even though they very much have not. Here are just a few reasons why the job market is still in a specifically pandemic-driven state of upheaval. The fact that COVID is very much still circulating, and along with it, a reported nearly 7% of U.S. adults being affected by some form of long COVID. The fact that many jobs have been wiped out by the pandemic. Just taking my state of New York as an example, quote, the Empire State is not expected to recover all the jobs lost from the COVID pandemic until at least late 2026, according to a new analysis. And within that, travel in particular has been cited as an issue with hotels still not recovered and government hiring being on a freeze, resulting in many fewer jobs statewide. And going back to our events situation at TFD, many industries are still heavily affected by the pandemic. For example, the convention slash meeting industry is only recovered to about 75% of pre-pandemic levels, according to one survey, which people who hate meetings and conferences may think is a positive thing, but also means an industry full of jobs that no longer exist. Plus, there's the general, unquantifiable ennui that so many of us experience from being effectively abandoned by our leadership after learning that it is actually totally possible to help middle-class Americans more, our government just usually doesn't want to do it. Basically, the narrative around the pandemic recovery and its effects on the economy, as well as our actual health, has been similar to the job market talk, a little bit of gaslighting. We're being told over and over that things are great, we are back and better than ever, baby. And yet many of our own lived experiences reflect the total opposite. And now we've also learned something we can never unknow, which is that we could be getting more for all of the taxes we pay. Basically, COVID is just a never ending version of that meme of like, we're so back, we're so f we're back and better than ever, it's never been worse. It's just that meme in perpetuity, basically. And speaking of people who have a unique relationship to the pandemic and its effects on the economy, there's also an entire generation, the Gen Z that we recently made an entire video essay about, who graduated college right into the middle of a pandemic and subsequent effects on the economy. Which brings us to chapter three. Congratulations, graduate, there are no jobs. Graduating into a terrible economy has frankly been giving millennials some flashbacks to the 2008 recession, and also to the very specific dynamic of being told to get a college degree because it's your ticket to success and prosperity versus how much of a hindrance that very college debt can be on any career. And it's not just the debt itself, it's also how little help degrees prove to have in certain industries. The narrative is basically, hey, 18 year old, sign on this loan for basically a small mortgage um, so that you can get a degree because if you don't, you'll never get a job. Actually surprised that degree doesn't get you a job at all. And more importantly, now you have like six figures of debt that you have to figure out a way to pay off, have fun. Because while jobs are being eliminated in all kinds of industries, the job search appears to be worse for those with college degrees than for those without one. In a Harris poll conducted on behalf half of Time Magazine, 52% of job seekers with a bachelor's degree or higher reported completing an interview process without receiving an offer versus 35% of job seekers with a high school diploma or lower. Of course, this is likely the result of undervaluing of labor combined with the overpromising of college degrees. But as someone who was just out of high school at the peak of the 2008 recession, I saw firsthand just how hard it was for those around me to find jobs. Elder millennials with master's degrees were regularly becoming baristas. I didn't have a master's degree, but I was also a barista. I honestly loved it though. I was a great barista. I think what makes Gen Z and millennials uniquely comparable is that they were primed to inherit a pretty rockin' economy and that changed pretty suddenly. So for some perspective, Gen Z entered the labor force in a world with between 3.4 and 4% unemployment roughly, only for that to skyrocket up to 14% at its peak. Millennials, meanwhile, they had an unemployment rate that hovered around 4% from 2006 to 2007, and it peaked at 10% during the height of the financial crash. So both were primed to enter what we might call these Goldilocks economies, and both suddenly saw that change as many of them were graduating high school, graduating college, and preparing to enter the labor force. But I think there are a couple of key differences in what makes the pandemic um, financial crisis distinct from the Great Recession from 2008 through roughly 2010. Um, and so I think the, the first of those is the speed with which unemployment rose. It took three months for the unemployment rate to peak in, in 2020 at 14%, while it took two years into the recession for it to hit its peak at 10%. 
Uh, so changes to the economy in 2008 through 2010 were gradual. Um, they ebbed and flowed while they were very sudden in 2020. Um, the second is who was affected. So during the Great Recession, men experienced higher unemployment than women, whereas in 2020, the unemployment rate among women peaked at 14%. Well, it peaked at about 12 for men. And unemployment rates for immigrants were worse in 2020 compared to the Great Recession, uh, but they were better for Black men in particular in 2020 compared to the Great Recession. There was a lot going on at the world in the world that was different, I think, in um, 2020 during the pandemic, most notably the pandemic itself, uh, then in 2009 through, you know, 2008 through 2010, roughly. Um, the mid-2000s were certainly no picnic, but a lot was going on in the world that perhaps made not only the economy, but, you know, just life more general feel more fraught in 2020. And not all millennials graduated into the 2008 recession. Generations span like 15 year periods. So even despite the zesty video titles, even we at TFD implement, millennials are not a monolith. However, for those who did graduate into the recession, we're removed enough now to know that the effects were long lasting. Quote, millennials who graduated into the Great Recession saw their wages drop 8% from their peak, and it took 10 years for wages to recover. Graduating into a recession is a uniquely bad situation for any generation. Boomers who graduated into the 1981 recession saw wages drop 15% and take 15 years to recover. As for Gen Z, the situation is eerily similar, though as I mentioned earlier, for quite a different reason, the pandemic. We spoke about this briefly with Dot in our video on Gen Z becoming the buy everything own nothing generation, but it's worth repeating. Gen Z has one of the highest levels of underemployment we have ever seen. There are so many news stories with complaints about Gen Z lacking interpersonal or professional skills or being more difficult to work with, but we have to remember, many of these girlies graduated into a literal pandemic. So not only did they have to isolate themselves more than their already tech savvy, sometimes you might say tech addicted generation was, they had way fewer opportunities to actually naturally gain the interpersonal skills that previous generations did when working in person with more established teams. Quote, Gen Z find themselves in an inhospitable labor market with challenges in finding employment opportunities. There are overwhelming concerns about a lack of jobs and financial security. Around 60% of 18 to 25 year olds said they're likely to switch jobs in 2023, up from 53% last year, according to Robert Half. This is where I think mentorship and sponsorship are really important. Now, sponsorship, that's somebody who can vouch for you in the rooms, um, but mentorship, and I know it's like, oh, I have to get a mentor. I, it doesn't even have to be that um, formal or, you know, prescriptive. It can truly be somebody who's already in your network. Maybe it's, you know, in your community or someone who goes to like your religious community, anything like that to taking on somebody older with a little bit of wisdom who can give you that big sister or big brother advice on professionalism because we are seeing it as a recruiter. Um, it's funny, we will have people who use slang terms or, you know, in interviews. And I think it, being able to bring someone in and say like, hey, will you do a mock interview with me? Hey, how can I set a best foot forward? And it it goes back to probably the most timeless advice there is, which is building a network and having a community of people that you can really trust. Um, and if you feel as though you don't have that now, there's so many organizations that are catered to young professionals. A lot of them even have mentorship programs like that comes with your general membership. So like people want to see you succeed. And more than anything, uh, we, the, we love Gen Z for the, like, they're so refreshing. They bring fresh ideas, but we are seeing that lack of professionalism. So I'm telling you, like, us millennials, like, we're excited to give you that advice just to see you succeed as well. And as I briefly mentioned in our intro, we are also in the midst of what many are calling the silent recession. We are all constantly consuming a media narrative that the economy is absolutely slaying and that this recession we were all hearing so much about simply never showed up. So why does it feel for so many of us like we're in a recession? People have started calling this a quiet recession or a silent recession because no one is able to keep up with the rising costs of living and interest rates. According to Bankrate, quote, half of Americans say that their overall financial situation is worse today than it was three years ago in November 2020, when the economy was in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, according to a separate Bankrate report published in November. 
A large part of that is because inflation is eroding America's safety nets. More than four in five Americans, 81%, said they did not increase their emergency savings this year, according to a bank rate poll published in October. Two thirds of them, 66%, say economic factors such as inflation, rising interest rates, or a change in their employment status or income were among the reasons why. And yet the stock market had a banner 2023 with stocks closing the year at an average 24% gain. But it's important to note that the stock market and how it's doing is one of the most powerful tools those who want to manipulate the narrative about the economy have to do so. Because the stock market actually has relatively little with how much of the economy or specifically the average middle-class American is actually doing. In 2022, for instance, we had the opposite problem we're seeing now, really low stock market returns, but really large hiring rates. Essentially, the stock market doing well just means that corporations are doing well. And as we all know, if you've ever worked for a corporation or knew someone who did, often what's great for their shareholders is terrible for the employees who have to work there, which we're getting into in our next chapter. But this is why we're talking about being gaslit by the economy. We're told that things are great, but then we're not able to find a job or buy a house we can afford because the economy booming is a reflection of how much money the ruling class is making. It's not actually reflective of the average worker. But as I mentioned, the very things that make the line go up on the stock market are just about whatever happens to be good for corporations. And perhaps nothing is a better example of that than chapter four. Layoffs, bad for workers, great for corporations. To further compound the frustration from being told we're in an economic boom, we are in an era of mass layoffs. But what many may not realize is that layoffs can help companies' bottom lines and thus help boost the economy. Yes, many companies have had to engage in layoffs because of real financial issues. Tech, for example, in many ways overhired during the pandemic when there was a huge boom in that sector and people were more glued to their devices than ever. But there are other reasons that layoffs happen, and one of them is just to widen profit margins to satisfy investors. According to a Business Insider article, quote, Meta's downsizing has been met with a hell yeah. The company's stock price has increased by more than 170% over the past year. Spotify's stock jumped 7.5% after its layoff announcements in December and is up 30% so far in 2024. And while a lot of the layoff talk is concentrated in tech, investors were also quite pleased about job cuts at Estee Lauder. Why we're seeing so many layoffs, um, if I'm being completely honest, a lot of companies are doing really well and had really strong uh final quarters of 2023. So I don't think it's a reflection of business health all of the time, but what is happening is we are having consultants give advice about layoffs. At the end of the day, it's profitable for companies to have layoffs and it is in the best interest for the company. So one thing that I think is changing with the climate is before it was, what companies are doing the best? Let's look at Amazon, let's look at the big names. They are still the ones doing at times the most layoffs or the biggest significant changes. So with that being said, I think it's really important to, and you can set up different Google alerts. There's different outlets that you can go towards, but at least I know in Texas, you could see like you have to report layoffs. So I would say, I think you have to start checking new resources to see who is having layoffs, really doing more homework and due diligence. But to answer your question of why layoffs are happening, it is in the benefit of a lot of businesses. Now, of course, that's not for everyone. Some people just truly are affected. We're seeing different industries change. I know I personally work in supply chain. So we saw a big boom uh, during COVID and now we're just teetering off. We're still doing well, we're still profitable, but we out kicked our coverage or we kind of like overestimated how we would be doing now. So, and then I think a lot of people are preparing for, you know, different stock, like stock related reasons. So a lot of people are cleaning house and working with really lean teams. And I think really pushing the envelope of what they can get away with. And this has all been happening during a simultaneous push for back to the office. If a push for the complete return back to office seems a little suspect to you, that's because it is. Quote, while a whopping 90% of companies plan to implement return to office policies by the end of 2024, flexibility remains a top priority for employees, and the lack of it might push them to seek other opportunities. However, that is exactly what some companies want, according to workplace experts that CNBC Make It spoke to. 
Now, companies would never admit to this because of the potential legal implications, but return to office mandates are an even more sinister way to cut down their workforce, since it can even force many employees to quit. Companies don't even have to do the work of deciding who to lay off, and they often don't have to pay out severance packages. Quote, one company that could be employing this covert layoff tactic is AT&T, which recently mandated that 26,000 managers across 50 states work in person, but only at offices at just nine locations. So we know that the single most requested workplace change from women is flexible working hours. Remote work is close behind, but really what at least women are are campaigning for is flexible hours. And I think for certain industries and certainly certain workplaces, the ability to work flexibly really became apparent during the pandemic, right? So this, this means, you know, maybe I get some work done early, early in the morning before family wake up, and then I can return to that work in the evening to afternoon, perhaps when my you know partner or uh, anyone else I'm living with returns and I have alternative options for childcare, and then I can return to my work. And so I'm still working an eight hour day, I'm still accomplishing everything I need to accomplish, but I'm doing it on a different schedule. And I know that that's something that in particular women are asking for of their employers and is a high priority for them. And so it strikes me that the return to work is like the return to office work is an answer both to that question and the and the request for continued remote work, right? So if you're working in the office exclusively, the flexibility question is out the window. Um, so it, it, you know, it strikes me that these tensions persist because of tensions that have existed for a long time in the American workforce, the tension between what do we want men and women to be doing? Like what kind of society and what kind of roles are we trying to incentivize when we structure how we set up our lives and how we set up our workplaces? And if we're trying to create a structure where women can have families if they desire it, have young children, um, and also be participating members in the labor force, either by choice or because financially they have to. Perhaps a better way to set that up would be to allow for flexible work. And it seems like the return to office pressure is a pretty resounding no to that request. Um, I don't think there's reason to despair necessarily yet. There's certainly some employers that have seen benefits from this and have decided to keep it going or keep it going as a possible option. Um, and I think that's something to be optimistic about, but uh, especially for the employers who are really adamant about returning to the office and want to use that as a way to let go without actually formally firing, you know, a glut of employees. I, I think that that's a pretty resounding, you know, no to those continued requests. There are other ways that companies gradually induce a layoff period, such as implementing a hiring freeze so that as people resign or retire, the workforce shrinks over time, cutting employee hours or putting a temporary furlough in place, which often forces employees to find other positions, and offering early retirement packages or voluntary buyouts, which can admittedly slay. This recently happened to a very good friend of mine who just hated her job to begin with, and she's on a permanent vacation, let me tell you that much. Now, amidst all of this upheaval and uncertainty, things become more complicated because of chapter five. The gig economy enters the chat. One thing that has changed enormously in the past few decades, driven both by the ubiquity of smartphones and the changes brought on by the pandemic, is the gig economy. Basically, more Americans than ever are working gig jobs, usually contracted, unprotected third-party work, often for what used to be full-time jobs. Here in my industry of the media, for example, it is incredibly common to have people working in essentially what are called permalancer positions, where they're basically working a full-time job, but classified as a freelancer so that the company 
company doesn't have to pay all kinds of taxes or offer benefits or give vacation time or basically do anything that employers are required to do. For the record, at least in New York State, this is illegal, but many people do it anyway. In fact, around 36% of US workers, approximately 57.3 million people in total, were part of the gig economy before the pandemic. As of 2023, though, 73.3 million freelancers are estimated to work in the USA. And I should say here that not only did I used to be a full-time freelancer and I still choose to freelance several times each year, so I'm certainly not opposed to the idea of freelancing. In fact, my father has been a freelancer my entire life. And working gigs can be great for filling in gaps or adding economic flexibility when doing things like, for example, changing careers, going back to school or starting a business. I freelanced a ton in the first two years of starting TFD. Contracted work can also have really negative impacts on basically any industry, depending on how it's implemented. To get a personal perspective on what it's like to make a living off of the career economy, we spoke with Dane, who is currently making ends meet, working with delivery apps while in between corporate jobs. Uh, a typical work week or, or sort of a, uh, an insight to what it is that I do is I split most of my time when I do gig work uh, doing uh, Instacart shopping, which is typically shopping for groceries for other individuals. And then I use the Spark Driver app, which is a company that does business with Walmart to either do Walmart grocery delivery or actually do the shopping for Walmart and and then deliver it to individuals who have placed those orders. Um, I learned very, very early on when I started doing this full time that in my specific area, it was going to be really impossible to rely on only one app to actually make any sort of decent money. I was going to have to alternate, which is what I spend my time doing. I will turn on both apps, usually after I take my son to school in the morning. And as soon as the offers come in, I kind of pick and choose depending on the distance and obviously how much I'm going to be making and what the estimated completion time is going to be. That's what informs which one I take. Um, I would probably say that one of the, the biggest misconceptions about the way that the gig economy works is so much of how quickly you get your stuff delivered to you is literally directly tied to how generous you're being with tips. Um, because a gig worker gets to choose through those different apps, like what orders they want to do. And unless there is incentive from the actual application itself to do orders that wouldn't pay very much otherwise, most of us are looking for the highest paying orders that involve driving the least amount of distance. Um, with Uber, since I have done that as well, it's a little bit different because it's ride sharing. Obviously distance is directly and inversely related to how much you get paid and tips are dynamic, they could change depending on how your ride goes with that person. But when you're delivering and you're doing grocery shopping for folks, a lot of that stuff is sort of set in stone. Um, you know, you could have somebody who wants you to drive 25 miles because they need you to pick up regular groceries and they just don't feel like doing it themselves. Um, and it, you get reimbursed $7 for doing that. Whereas I could have somebody who wants to pick something up from the local grocery store or like from the local Walgreens and the order itself is only about five or six bucks, but they're giving me, you know, a 20 to $30 tip to drive two miles. Obviously it, that's the one I'm going to prioritize. Um, the problem therein comes when you start relying on this as regular income that you can't always be super picky and super choosy if you need money to come in. Sure, there are some instances where you're like, okay, well, if I take this order, I'm going to be driving a ton and it's not going to reimburse me. It's not worth my time. But if you need, if you're doing this to support yourself full time, you can't always reject offers that are less than ideal because then the application will start to flag you as someone who consistently doesn't accept offers unless they look a specific way. Because aside from how frustrating the gig economy can be from the perspective of someone looking for full-time employment, there's also the issue of how much it contributes to wage depression. Quote, a number of studies have documented gig workers' subminimum wages. Nearly a third of gig workers, 29%, reported earning less than the minimum wage in their state, according to a June 2022 report by the Economic Policy Institute. In New York City, where the minimum wage is $15 per hour, app-based delivery drivers earn an average of $11.12 per hour after deducting expenses, according to a November 2022 study by the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. My hourly rate, if I were to break it down, is going to be highly dependent on how much work I'm doing that day. 
and just how long it physically takes me to complete. It's harder to gauge that when you're factoring in all the other expenses. I think it'd be easier for me to surmise it if I was only talking about this is how long I work and then this is how much I, I brought home for that time. Um, and then let people at home do the math of like, okay, but well you have to deduct this, 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 and this. I would say if I was working a weekend, let's say Saturday and Sunday, or let's just say Sunday, let's, let's use the best case scenario. Let's say I was working on a Sunday and it's when every, it's like on a, on a game day and everybody's placing orders because nobody wants to go out. Uh, folks are ordering alcohol, which also drives the price up. Um, I could probably work for about eight hours. Um, the last time that I did that, I think that it ended up breaking down to anywhere between 18 to $20 an hour after I factored in what my take-home pay was. But again, that was working a full-blown eight-hour day, and I didn't even take a lunch break in that. Um, and it's also constantly driving around, constantly being inside of a grocery store, shopping for things. It's it's go, 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 and it's no stopping whatsoever. Um, there's other times where maybe I will, you know, especially when I was still employed full time elsewhere, where I would turn on the app after work and then just kind of see what I could do. Sometimes you luck out. Sometimes you could get an order that involves six different stops. Everybody tipped really well and you end up getting paid 40, $50 for what amounts to maybe an hour and a half's worth of work. That's not bad, but that's not consistent. That's a one off one day type of thing. Um, I would say that the actual average of what most folks probably end up doing if they're not doing ride share and they're doing like what I'm doing, alternating or double apping as we call it, they're probably looking at closer between $15 to $17 an hour, which is what makes it great for a side hustle and which is what makes it terrible for full-time income. It involves a level of effort and dedication and a sacrifice of your personal time that a regular nine to five just doesn't, right? Um, there really is no such thing as as stopping. I mean, even when I have my kids on the weekends that I get them, I still have to pull the apps up and look and see what the activity is like because weekends are a lot of gig workers bread and butter. That's when you're gonna get the biggest influx of orders. Um, and it also involves not really working a classic nine to five schedule because some folks don't place their orders until they get done with their nine to five. Um, a lot of times during the day, you're not delivering to individuals, but you're delivering to businesses and even just figuring out how long it's going to take you to find a parking spot so you can get out of your car to make that delivery becomes a factor in, oh gosh, do I want to take orders during this time slot during the day? And speaking of delivery apps, many of these gig models don't just represent a bad deal for the workers who are often being paid sub-minimum wage. They can also be terrible for every side of the industry, worker, customer, and the business itself. Just a quick look at the meteoric rise of delivery food, for example. Quote, the average American spends over $1,800 per year on food delivery. Nearly a third of that amount goes to service fees, delivery fees, and tips. For one example, a Subway order can cost up to 91% more on Uber Eats than in store. And restaurants have to pay exorbitant fees to be listed on these apps, often up to 30% of the order value. Given the slim profit margins in the restaurant business, these fees can be crippling. I would say the vast majority of people are not good tippers. <laughs> um, and that's just, I think that a lot of folks are under the impression. That's another thing that I think a lot of folks are under the impression. They are under the impression that I work for Instacart or that I work for Walmart. That is not the case. We are independent contractors. The guy who's bringing your groceries does not work for Walmart. That's why going back and complaining to Walmart, if something is amiss, is not going to go anywhere because chances are the reason why that order was messed up is because it happened at a store level. We are literally just the middleman saying, here you go, unless it was an order that we physically shopped for. And in that instance, Instacart is a little bit better than Walmart because they will hold their individuals accountable to a certain degree. Um, I almost used to think, or I had I had the, the incorrect notion that uh, where I would be delivering to was what was going to affect what tips I got. You know, we have a tendency to think that if you deliver to uh, an area that maybe is less well to do, you'll probably get less tips. And if you, you know, do deliveries in a more luxurious or high end area, you know, maybe the tips will be better there. 
and it really is just all over the place. I mean, I've had very, very uh, low income folks tip me very, very well for relatively modest orders. I've delivered to the folks that live in the well-to-do neighborhoods that are close to where my apartment is at. And sometimes they will tip barely anything. Maybe that's why they live in those houses because they don't tip very well. <laughs> They're hoarding all their wealth for themselves. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really just a crapshoot to be completely honest with you. Some folks tip really great some tip uh, like not at all and honestly if you're ever wondering why your uber eats or your doordash or any other order that you're placing takes forever to get delivered it's because the drivers are seeing your order pop up in the app and they're seeing how how much it doesn't make sense to take that order because you're not tipping well enough for it uh if you were to if, if tips were not a thing if they weren't involved i think people would be shocked to see how much uh, drivers were accepting orders for. I mean, we're talking five to 10 bucks, maybe a pop to drive 10, 15 miles. When, when you start to do the math, if you take the tips out of it, that doesn't make a whole lot of financial sense. So if you want to incentivize somebody to get your Instacart order quickly, or if you want your dasher to pick up your order quick, honestly, the more you tip, the more likely you're going to get somebody who is going to be awesome and is going to pick that up and do it immediately. Essentially, gig work has filled in a lot of gaps, and again, working freelance can sometimes be hugely beneficial. I've done it before full time and still do it today. But just like all the other gaslighting, it is often framed as a kind of utopian solution to our more deeply embedded labor problems. And there's a big difference between advocating for yourself for a great rate on a freelance job that you are happy to take versus being obligated to stay in positions that are contracted when you should have the rights of a full-time employee. But now let's get to the practical conversation with chapter six. You're looking for a job. As Azalea Banks once said, so what now? So as we've gone over in this video, things are bleak in a lot of ways. And it can feel like looking for a job right now is totally hopeless, especially if you're in an already competitive industry. But it's important to focus on the practical steps you can take while you're searching for work, while of course hopefully also having room to deal with some of the more macro issues. These things are political. Now, truthfully, the best time to be looking for any job is when you don't need one. Not only do you have way more leverage and can take your time, which we'll go into detail in the next point, but it is also worth noting that depending on how long you've been with your current employer, you're likely being underpaid for your position and therefore moving out is often the best way to move up in terms of compensation. But if you're in the position of just being stuck looking, the first step is to take a full inventory of your online presence to make sure that you're not accidentally undermining yourself when people visit your profiles or websites, because you would be shocked at how many people don't often do this. Here's a little checklist. Is your resume up to date and written in action-oriented, quantifiable language? This is a minor little digression here, but I cannot tell you the number of people whose resumes I've looked at that are basically written in passive voice. I mean, sometimes it feels like slam poetry. I'm like, what were you actually doing at this job and what were the tangible results of it? I do think that if you have the privilege of being able to work with someone like a career coach or someone who can help you optimize your resume, that would be worth it. But at the very least, go through everything you're listing out and make sure it feels like something that gives a really clear clear and quantifiable view into what you do at your job. Next are your business profiles, like on LinkedIn or industry-specific websites, fully optimized. If you're a freelancer, are you listing a rate card, which in general, I always recommend against because you would be surprised at how many people, and especially bigger companies, if you work with those as clients, could afford to be paying you more. And if you're listing your rate card publicly, that's often negotiating against yourself. And are things like your personal bios, your contact info, your portfolios, if applicable, even a headshot, current and accurate. And when it comes time to actually looking for and applying for work, it's really important to be thoughtful and target the places that you're actually taking the time to apply to. Especially because a lot of these online applications are extremely tedious and require you to fill out forms in addition to sending PDFs that often have the exact same information listed in them, there is an opportunity cost for every single application you send. And although sometimes just sending a million resumes out into the void can feel like you're doing something, you would probably be better off directing that energy elsewhere and targeting your application to a more curated list of candidates. To really know if it's going to be a good fit for you, this is where I think you really have to do a lot of self-reflection and realize what is it that you're looking for. Again, I want to acknowledge that we're in a very interesting season of inflation and layoffs. So I, I also don't think it's wrong. You might not hear this from every recruiter or every career coach. I actually don't think it's wrong to be in a season of 
survival and to pick a job that is ultimately going to make the most sense financially for you and your family, whether that be the benefits that they offer, um, the time off that they offer, maternity plans, things of that nature. So that's why I do think you just have to take inventory of your goals, personal and professional, and align them with the company. But now to know if it's going to, because um, you said there's so many ghost listings, we deal with a lot of fraudulent listings, unfortunately. So going back, seeing if, that, if it's actually on the company website is one really easy step you can do just to see if it's even legitimate. And then from there, I would go, I always like to do a little LinkedIn stalking. So seeing um, who the role will report into, kind of taking a look at their background. Um, Cause you know, you take a world like marketing, marketing can mean something so different in so many different industries. So really getting into um, what are like the niche topics and subtopics I'll get to be working on in that role. And then I think that's also where People have to remember, especially in a time like this, when you may feel disempowered, it is the you you are interviewing them just as much as they are interviewing you. So going in with those pointed questions, I think this is a time where we kind of need to put aside the what's do you like working here? What's the culture like? Not that those aren't thoughtful questions, but it could be, hey, how do you guys apply employee feedback? And what was something you implemented last year based off employee feedback? Or monetarily, hey, how long um, do I need to stay in this role? Because a lot of companies, my company included, we are changing our internal policies based off of like how we do internal promotions. So, hey, what are the guidelines for internal promotion? Um, I would also get really clear on success metrics because some companies do not have those outlined and defined. And I think that ultimately is going to answer the question of, is this going to be or not going to be a great fit. And then one thing I do want to mention too is if you do take a job because you sincerely have to, I do believe a lot of us will be in a season of maybe taking a step back to propel forward. So understanding what you're sacrificing at the end of the day. So if you are sacrificing, maybe you're taking a pay cut, maybe you now have to go into the office three days a week and that's costing you gas or if it's me, just like driving anxiety, <laughs> I think it's understanding now, what are you going to get in return? So learning again about those employee programs, learning new skills, or sometimes it's just to put yourself in new rooms that you previously weren't already in. Those are the other things to take stock of too, because that plays a part into like work-life integration as a whole. And in terms of what else you could be doing during this time, maximizing financial flexibility while you're looking for a job is key. Now, ideally you would have already built up a robust emergency fund to be helping supplement you during this time, but we understand that that's not realistic for everyone and you might just find yourself in a position where it's too late. But now would be a good time to look into side work to help relieve the pressure while you are doing that searching. But as I mentioned, I also want to get into part two of this practical advice, which is what to do when you're not actively looking but want to protect yourself against some of this economic chaos. Because job security is a myth, babe. There is nothing requiring your employer to be loyal to you. So at the same time, you don't owe them that loyalty. So another little checklist, always be looking. You don't necessarily have to be actively interviewing for jobs at all times, though it doesn't hurt and it is good practice, but you should always be maintaining your network and keeping your profiles active. And that means regularly reaching out to your connections or even people you know from your industry, building up your visibility in their professional networks. I know networking is a very taboo term for a lot of us, but unfortunately, it really does work and taking advantage of any ongoing education or certifications that you might be able to take on while working or that your employer might be offering you to get for free. We've been very lucky at TFD that over the years we've had an extremely low employee turnover rate, but we try to remain competitive with our employees and give them an environment that they don't want to leave. That is unfortunately not how a lot of companies operate. Many of them actually want the higher turnover because then they never have to pay anyone that much. <laughs> But if you choose to stay an internal hire, I think it, now is the time to really see like what leadership programs can you almost like milk the system back? <laughs> like what can you get back in return? Um, I know reviews are coming up for a lot of people. So I think this is really the time to have those hard conversations, but also get look at all of the the employee programs that you have, because no matter what, this is the time to really acquire the skills so that you can leave and make more money when the tide turns. 
if I have honest advice, I would really caution people right now from leaving, which is not really advice I would typically give in the past. That's only because typically, you know, uh, last one's in, first one's out. Um, now, have do I have people in my life who have changed jobs in the last six months and are doing fine? Yes, but I do know uh, you tend to be the most vulnerable when you haven't when you have less tenure at a company. But as I mentioned, another aspect of protecting yourself is having that emergency fund. Especially right now in a volatile job market and a silent recession, having an emergency fund is extra crucial. And if you're new here, you may not know that an emergency fund is generally about three to six months of your living expenses on the low end. It doesn't have to be a three to six months where you're going to a bachelorette party every month. And if you can afford it, going past those six months is extremely helpful because according to data from the top resume, the average job search right now can take between five to six months on average. It's also important to remember that your emergency fund needs to be liquid, meaning that you're keeping it in a regular savings account, even a high yield savings account, rather than keeping it tied up in, for example, an investment account, because you need to be able to access it. And sometimes it's not a great time to pull money from an investment account. And in addition to your emergency fund, it's also always good to have a second stream of income you can tap into. Now, in an ideal scenario, you have a stream of passive income from investments or real estate, but it can also be a freelance job that you can tap into when needed. I was just talking today about a friend of mine who several times per year does little spurts of dog sitting and dog walking just to shore up her emergency fund and put a lot more money into some of her sinking funds. And she has a really high paying full-time job. I personally have my other book writing and I take on about one to two consulting clients throughout the year on various media related projects. I used to tutor English and French when I needed extra cash. It can be any number of things and you don't always need to be doing it, but knowing what that stream of income is and how you can set up a way to tap into it when necessary is something great to do when you don't need it. In general, having something that you can turn on or scale up is a lot easier than starting from nothing. If you are looking to start a side income, well, first to protect yourself, ensure that there's no conflict of interest with your company. Some companies do have that written into your offer letter or your agreement. Um, it would really suck to get laid off for that reason. Um, but moving on to actually building it, I think getting very clear on your niche and your audience um, and then really building a platform that's going to be uh the most aligned with that. So whether that be TikTok or Instagram, and then I think value add, I think we are oversaturated <laughs> with coaches and, and people who do a little bit of everything, especially those who maybe don't always have certifications or qualifications to back it up. Um, so I think that is absolutely where let's, what value add are you bringing to your audience? And, and then I think get, dive into that education and invest with podcasts, if you can, courses and workshops. Um, if that's not an option right now, there's so much free education out there um, and really making sure that you're standing out. Um, and then I'd, I would also say, like, don't be afraid to try something new. Um, I know there's a lot of people who want to do content creation and that's fabulous, but I think there's nothing wrong with finding like dog walking or trying, I think, streams that are outside of social media as well, because some people make incredible money um, doing things that you would be surprised by, so. And of course, you also want to focus on being what our friend Lauren over at Career Contessa describes as being an invaluable employee versus an indispensable one. Basically, an indispensable employee is one who performs one task and is the only one who performs it. Without them in their role, the company would at least temporarily fall apart. However, while this sounds like a good position to be in, it can prime people to not only be overworked, but also easily replaced because they are much less likely to ever be promoted since the company needs them in that role. And if the company decides to get rid of that role in layoffs, there's nowhere else for that person to go. Being invaluable, on the other hand, means you're super malleable as an employee and can take on whatever the job is that needs to be done. Now, we all know the dangers that can come with taking on more than what's in your job description, but there is a difference between being taken advantage of and showcasing your value. If you can show that you're adaptable to different roles and situations and that you bring a lot to the table for different projects, oftentimes you're more likely to be moved around in a corporation rather than let go and also more more likely to be promoted. Of course, there's no such thing as totally layoff proofing your career. Very talented people get laid off all the time, but putting in enough effort to be valuable in your role, maintain professional networks, and beefing up your finances are all things anyone can do to soften the blow of unexpected turmoil. 
As with everything we talk about on this channel, there's only so much you can do on a personal level when it comes to a chaotic economy. But on a societal level, it is important for us to think clearly about what we can advocate for and what faulty narratives we can even unintentionally be repeating in our own lives, like for example, conflating the stock market with the actual economy. We can demand more from our politicians. As I mentioned, we saw during the pandemic that we are actually capable of helping middle-class Americans, poor Americans, and real struggling small businesses do more and do better. It's just a question of priorities, which in America usually end up being just giving more tax breaks to rich people and corporations. And most importantly, we can give ourselves the mental reassurance of knowing that we are not crazy when we hear all of these news stories about how great everything is, from the economy to the job market to the post-pandemic recovery, and we're feeling like, mm, survey of myself says that's inaccurate. You are right. These are manipulated narratives that spin a very specific story and are true for only a very limited part of the population. Accepting the situation, doing what we can to prepare on an individual level, and being more aware and engaged on a social political level are the recipes for a population that's slightly less easy to gaslight into thinking that everything is fine. As always, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you back here next month with an all new video essay. Bye guys.